What we're going to do as part of the program with Dr. DeSalvo is rather than using a, a kind of a one-way communication approach, she and I are going to have a question and answer period. So again, an individual who's been a tremendous supporter of ours um, over the years, um, an individual that has supported policy and financial undertakings of vital, an individual that I know believes in the power of health information to improve care and to reduce the cost of care for the citizens of Vermont, please join me in welcoming Governor Peter Shumlin. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, John Evans. Thanks to all of our par partners, and uh, thank you for being here. Boy, that light is such that I can't see beyond the fourth row. But I assume there's really Vermonters out there working hard and enjoying breakfast that you got your coffee. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. And uh, I've got to say, uh, the work that Vital is doing and the team is doing uh, to ensure that we get health care right is really the foundation for Vermont's future. Um, I just had an opportunity to uh, meet with Dr. DeSalvo and uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Vermont. And I'm really honored to have her here. Uh, it's a great honor. She's doing extraordinary work. She's been on a job for about seven months. I'll talk a little bit about her in a minute. But I just want to talk to the providers in the room, to the folks in IT, to the folks who are working so hard to get health care right, uh, to talk a little bit about why this is so critical to Vermont's future. I sometimes wonder why more governors, uh, more folks in Congress, although I don't, my expectation is they're pretty low these days, uh, aren't focused on the challenge that we are focused on here in the state of Vermont, which is how we take one of the best delivery systems in the country, where Vermonters get extraordinary care, and find ways through technology to spend less money for better health care outcomes. And when I think about the privilege of being governor, you know, I have to deal with the short-term crises and things that you deal with every day that, you know, could consume you 24-7. But I also have to ask, you know, when I'm done being governor, when Vermonters are done with me, will we have addressed the real issues that challenge us going forward around job creation, around quality of life, and around affordability? And I say that this issue, the work that you're doing, uh, as technology is the foundation of our success, will determine Vermont's future. Why? You know this better than I, but right now, Vermonters on average spend 20 cents of every dollar we make on health care. If health care costs were to grow for the next decade at the same rate that they did for the past decade, that number would double. It doubles. And, you know, I don't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a Progressive or none of the above. I've yet to find a Vermonter who will raise their hand and say, wow, you know, we think that a recipe for prosperity is to continue on the track that we're on with health care spending because that's really going to be great for our families. I, I just haven't found that person yet. In fact, there's broad and wide consensus across Vermont that if we keep doing what we've always done with health care, if we don't reform the system, we won't succeed. So yeah, this is a tough conversation. This is tough stuff. But you all at Vital are at the foundation that will allow us to deliver better health care outcomes for less money than we otherwise would have spent. That's what this is all about in plain English, to assure that a decade from now, Vermonters aren't being asked to pay 30 or 40 cents of every dollar they make on health care, so that they can invest in education and sneakers for the kids and oil for the tank this winter and all the other challenges that the middle class is struggling with, not only in Vermont, but around the country. So this conversation that we're having today is central, not just to health care delivery, it's central to the quality of life in Vermont. And it's why I will not rest, I will not rest until we team up with you 
to make sure that we figured out how to move from a system that currently gobbles up dollars in a fee-for-service system to one that moves to an outcomes-based payment system where we're spending letter, bet, less money for better outcomes. Now, a lot of folks who aren't in the industry as you are say, wow, Gov, you know, that sounds really tough. That sounds really hard. And I say, yeah, sure, change can be hard, but really, when you think about it, we've got some pretty small shoes to fill. I mean, let's be honest about this. We spend more money on health care than any other developed country that we're competing with for jobs and economic opportunity, any of them, by far. Our infant mortality deaths rates are higher than theirs are. Our life expectancy is lower than theirs. Our outcomes are not as good as theirs are, but we're just spending tons of loot. So if we can get the technology right, which I believe Vital is on track to do and we're making great progress, so that we can actually carefully have the data that will allow us to move to better outcomes for less money, we all win. So that's why this summit is so critically important. That's why the work that you're doing at Vital is so critically important. That's why I and others are going to support you all the way. Now listen, are we always going to get everything right? No, of course not. Are we going to make mistakes? Sure. Do we have challenges that we try to integrate the system? Of course we do. But bottom line is, raise your hand if we think we can just stand still, keep doing what we were doing, and still expect to prosper. So I hope we're going to have more governors, more political leaders partnering with folks like Vital to make sure that we get spending right. It's a real honor to have Dr. DeSalvo here today. As you know, she's the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. She's been on a job for about seven months now. She's a go-getter who speaks plain English, understands the challenge, and wants to help. That's not too common coming out of Washington, D.C. Common sense. For those of you who don't know uh, Dr. Karen DeSalvo, she is a physician, as is her husband. Uh, she focused for 20 years uh, on improving access to affordable, high-quality health care. She done this through direct patient care, medical education, policy, and administrative roles, and as a researcher. She's smart. As a national coordinator for health IT, She's leading the nation's charge to promote, adopt, and meaningfully use health information technology in order to achieve better care and lower costs, as I've just talked about. It's critical for America. She knows it's critical for Vermont. I know she's impressed by the work we're doing here. Before joining the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, she was health commissioner for the city of New Orleans. And, the New Orleans, and she also was, uh, worked with the New, or New Orleans mayor, Mitchell Landro, senior as senior health care policy advisor. So she was, uh, has a great record in, in uh, Louisiana. Uh, while there, she transformed the outmoded health department to a modern and effective one and restored health care to a city that was absolutely devastated by the storm that we all remember so well. Prior to joining the mayor's administration, Dr. Salvo is a professor of medicine and vice dean for community affairs and health policy at Tulane's School of Medicine. Second rate compared to UVM, but not bad. <laughs> Dr. DeSalvo also served as president of the Louisiana Health uh, Care Quality Forum, uh, the state's lead for the Health Information Exchange, and the National Association of Chiefs of General Internal Medicine. I'm sure she's rolling her eyes now because I get introductions like this and they go on and on they all get they get back to what you did in kindergarten but I'm not going to go back that far she served uh, on the board of the National Association of County and City Health Officials and the Society of General Internal Medicine I won't give you the rest of her uh, background you can look it up but I can tell you this uh, Karen gets it she's here to help we have a imaginative understanding leader of healthcare IT in America 
that's here to partner with all of us in this room to make sure that we get it right in Vermont, and as she just mentioned to me, that once we do, we convince the other 49 states to join up. So thanks for the work you're doing. Thanks for being here today. And let's give it up for uh, Karen. Where are you, Doc? There you are. Thank you for being here. Go get him. Appreciate you. Go get him. So, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'd like to try to start by talking to Dr. DeSalvo a little bit about what she has seen during her initial period uh, as head of the ONC. I guess my question for you is, what surprised you the most? What's um, perhaps uh, met or not met your expectations? And uh, also, as we go through the questions, I just want to let folks know we do have audience mics. so. If you have a question, we'll try to uh, break off and, and engage the audience in that. So I'm sorry, Dr. DeSalvo. Well, good morning, John. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for having me today. Um, you know, Vital is, it, it is, you all are a leader in the country and you're doing some amazing work. So I'm thrilled to get to learn more about that firsthand. Uh, and I want to share with everyone that I um, did have my maple syrup for breakfast. <laughs> um, so that when, because I always tell people when you go to Louisiana, have gumbo, because you won't have it like that anywhere else. And so I'm going to do a little taste test all day long. Um, uh, what has surprised me most or what um, really uh, wasn't as clear to me, I think, coming from the ground, would, would really be that... Um, it's not so much a surprise, but I think some clarity around maybe two big areas. One is that we need to do a better job at the federal level of meeting communities where they are, mm -hmm. to understanding in a quantified and qualified way what their challenges are, what their priorities are, and how they're moving forward together so that we can serve in that role of enabling and removing barriers uh, to, to that change. I've been uh, across the country in the last few months, I've had the chance to do 11 formal listening sessions, and I'll be doing one later today here in Vermont. And it's a, a really great opportunity for me to get out of the beltway, hear from folks what's really happening on the ground. And I'll tell you the diversity in this country is tremendous, and I haven't even made it uh, everywhere. But, you know, for example, even take a situation like um, rural providers. I was in Alabama a few weeks ago, and their big challenge in health IT, they have a few, but one of them is about access mm -hmm. in rural communities. And I understand that you all have a very rural um, state and mm -hmm. have taken that head on mm -hmm. uh, to work on broadband so it doesn't become mm -hmm. a barrier. Mm -hmm. And I think learn, learning how we can, as a federal government, bring states like Vermont together with states like Alabama so that you can help each other solve those, those barriers and we can do what might make sense at the federal level. For example, we've used partnership with the USDA in the past to help rural communities get access to broadband. So these are things that I bring home and think about what are the, what are the opportunities our federal partners have. And, and I, I, I want to mention one other thing that I think is startling, and I hope we'll get to talk about it a little bit later, is um, how much, um, how loud the consumer voice is mm -hmm. about their expectation that they're going to not just control their data, but have the chance to participate in the health IT um, ecosystem, that they are a part of that, and, and in a way that's not just us allowing them to see their data, but they're part of that exchange of information, mm -hmm. and they have the opportunity to to inform and correct that information. The, the SOAP note was created here in Vermont. It was. And uh, some by Stillman, some 45 minutes away. And it was a structured data capture for a note. And we were always um, in a nice, up until about two months ago when I taught students on the weekends was saying, the subjective is the patient's part of the note. The objective assessment and plan is the physician's part of the note or the vet's part of the note, as I learned this morning. Someone, the vets use that too. Um, all to say that that in the in the house of medicine, we think that the subjective part is what patients say to us, and that's where we enter the information. The world has evolved dramatically mm -hmm. from that time of structured data capture, and the objective information comes from consumers and patients, and should be welcome in the note, and they should have the opportunity to look at the assessment and plan. So. I think those are sort of two different areas, but one is really thinking about how we, as a federal government, can be better partners at the local level, be more thoughtful and nuanced, and then also how do we do a much 
um, more aggressive job of welcoming consumers into their space, which is the healthcare space. I, it's great that you mentioned uh, the soap note. Uh, Dr. Larry Weed, mm -hmm. um, who uh, perhaps many folks in the audience may know that name, uh, the interesting part for me is that uh, we moved our offices the uh, last couple of months, and his old office actually is now contained within Vital's new really? space. So, yeah, it's kind of a unique. So uh, it's kind of neat that Larry Weed's thinking and vision are kind of part of what we do to some extent now. So He's a yeah. pioneer. Yes, exactly. Yes. So as Governor Shumlin was talking about uh, prior to taking your post at Health and Human Services, mm -hmm. uh, you were a health commissioner for City of New Orleans. You were involved with uh, Hurricane Katrina, started building neighborhood health clinics. Um, and, and as I'm told, they have were implemented with fairly advanced HIT capabilities. Can you share a little bit about that with us? Right. Um, I, so I, I was health, became health commissioner in, in 2011, and of course Katrina was prior to that. So I was um, on the faculty at Tulane at the time of Katrina, and uh, I think the, the, the take-home message about that for the audience in particular is that the work that I had the chance to participate in in New Orleans was very community-driven, very civically engaged. Mm -hmm government largely failed us in the city of New Orleans. And I think it taught our community how important it is to build strong, durable co collaborations that are from the grassroots and can make change. Uh, the change we were trying to make was to build a healthcare system that um, the people of our community deserve. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, unlike Vermont, mm -hmm. some of the worst health outcomes and highest cost in the country. And at the time in Medicare, it was the highest cost, the, the worst outcomes. So to uh, rebuild back after um, the devastation of the flooding uh, from that clean slate, we made a decision that um, if we wanted to change our outcomes, have you know a better care at a lower cost, then we would have to re-engineer the system. And the re-engineering would require data. So not only would we have to put primary care on the front line, something that we didn't have um, at the rate that you mm -hmm. enjoy in Vermont, uh, and and um, have to really put a line in the sand about saying quality mattered and we were going to talk about it and we were going to work through it together mm -hmm. and that we were going to find a way to um, finance health care so that everyone had not just a place to go but uh, some sort of a, um, an insurance option mm -hmm. so that they would have a, a vote in their care. But the IT really mattered to do all those things because you had to understand the population you were serving you needed to know the value of the care. So we set out in the earliest days um, when we lost any paper records or started clinics de novo to go straight to electronic mm -hmm. health records on the front lines and then um, built over time through, um, uh, through the Beacon program, uh, population level, regional uh, health information exchange at the state level, use the regional extension center program mm -hmm. that you all have to help providers on the front line and then to connect that through health information exchange i was the quality forum was the uh, uh, something we created after hurricane katrina to be a table that we sat to work on primary care and and quality and health it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, but at the local level we were pretty pretty aggressive about doing that we considered that uh, we wouldn't have strong care unless we had a strong way to know if we were delivering strong care mm -hmm. and the data really mattered, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not just for the individual that you were you were uh, providing services to in that clinical environment right there in front of you um, every day, but uh, also for the population mm -hmm. level. And of course, for us, having been marked by that disaster uh, in a way that um, will be with us forever, mm -hmm. it, knowing that when people are evacuated and they don't, uh, have access to their regimen for chemotherapy or uh, blood thinner or tuberculosis meds, et cetera. It's a potentially devastating consequence. So we wanted not just for every day, but for disaster to create an infrastructure mm -hmm. that was strong. Mm -hmm. the, um, the city of New York was, of course, hit hard with uh, mm -hmm. Sandy, and uh, there were some great stories about how the health information exchange data there was used, particularly on with medications to support patients. Um, the whole issue of bringing clinical and patient data from these disparate health information systems and EHRs together is, as you know, one of the bigger challenges. We talked about this over breakfast um, this morning. It's something that uh, I know the audience has worked very closely with Vital to support interface development. Uh, I think we've made great strides, but it continues to be a challenge, and I know that um, you recently posted your 10-year vision for achieving interoperable health IT. You had a, 
um, number of states down uh, within the last couple of weeks, I think. I know Vermont went. I know a member of uh, Vital Team went. Does that mean interoperability is your top priority, or? Yes. Okay. And <laughs> <it's> a, <laughs> I'll just stop there. And, and, and let me, you know, interoperability is two things. It's a means to an end, and it's a tie that binds. Mm -hmm. So it's a means to an end in the sense that um, what we're trying to do is see that the data's there when, when and where it matters most mm -hmm. for the people we're here to serve, and um, that it's available for the use cases that we want. It is, um, whether that's science or public health or, or care or consumers' mm -hmm. engagement and a host of other opportunities. It's also, I think, a tie that binds in the sense that there, there has to be data to share and mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to get to put in motion. And so that requires that we get adoption right. It requires that we, um, we really put the pedal to the metal on um, expanding the types of providers who are in beyond meaningful use and um, making the systems more usable on the front line so mm -hmm. that it's um, really enabling workflow and not uh, inhibiting it in any way. And then, of course, that we set some expectations about governance, et cetera, and mm -hmm. how we're going to entrust the data to whom and, and how we'll handle it if someone violates that trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have, do you have any ideas on how our state and other states in the ONC mm -hmm. might be able to encourage vendors towards um, greater interoperability with clinical systems. You know, we're seeing um, in the marketplace uh, groups of EHIE, EHR vendors coming together. Um, I view that a little bit of a kind of a market play for um, being able to capture more business. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you had some thoughts about um, how can we get the vendors to work closer with us so that we can actually move towards that level of interoperability that I know you have a vision for? Before I forget, um, remember that even though it's a 10-year vision to a learning health system, we're not going to wait for 10 years. Mm -hmm. There are immediate opportunities, we believe, to, um, to begin to move data in ways that, that are appropriate. To that end, mm -hmm. um, this idea of uh, the lack of of seamless interoperability <clears throat> between uh, EHR systems is one of the, the opportunities we have. Uh, I might put that in the, the bucket of things that, that I'm pleasantly surprised about mm -hmm. as national coordinator that, that most vendors with whom I speak, uh, certainly the providers with whom I speak, are, uh, are ready and willing to share information across the discrete lines of tax ID numbers and state mm -hmm. borders. Mm -hmm. And, and, and developer products, but um, for a variety of reasons, we haven't um, really had an expectation of standardizing standards. We've allowed, uh, uh, you know, a thousand flowers to bloom, and we have now a lot of um, standards for some of the basic core things that we would want mm -hmm. to, to be available. And so the, the good news is the timing is different than I believe it was when we were just beginning to really take off and develop a few years ago these new multitude of new systems, and, and it's... Um, so I, setting that table, excuse me, as national coordinator in partnership with standards development organizations and others is it's the time to, to get it straight. And you mentioned it, the developers are working on this on their own mm -hmm. in some ways, and that's great because the arc of rulemaking is long. Mm -hmm. And if we want to really get some things done in the short term, we have an opportunity to work with the private sector to, to make some change now, set some guidelines. The, you know, the, the other piece about this, though, is the interoperability as, as you well know, is more than the technology and the standards, mm -hmm. though that is a, a core piece. Mm -hmm. And we have, for example, an opportunity to work with state leadership around um, um, what I'd call interoperability for areas like privacy laws mm -hmm. and consent mm -hmm. to think about how we can um, create a, uh, some alignment so that when the person's going from New York to Vermont mm -hmm. or New Jersey to Pennsylvania, that, that that consent is known and available and that, that not only the patient can go, but the data can go. Great, thank you. We can just pause and see if there's any questions from the audience. I can't quite see out more than three feet. So anyone from the audience have a question at this point? We can't, okay. see, we can't see a thing. Yeah, keep going, okay. Yell out if you do and I'll turn, over, turn it over to you on the mic. Um, so ONC is, 10 years old, um, it's a cute story when um, I was involved in helping get uh, Vital going. I wanted to get in to uh, meet with the first head of the ONC, David Brailler, 
Um, so you may recall President Bush during the uh, debates had announced an electronic health record for America in 10 years. And I called the ONC and wanted to try to find out how I could get in there to talk to him. Where would Vermont fit into this? And they said, you know, it was going to be a long way to, to, to get in to see him. So I asked what his travel plans were, and he was going to be out in San Diego at a meeting. So I decided to fly out there. And I tracked him down. I'm not a stalker. And um, he was at a bar uh, with, his, uh, with his colleagues. It was after the meeting. It was after the meeting. And uh, went up to him and introduced myself. And it's a true story. And uh, he was uh, extremely um, helpful. He grabbed this team of people together. Uh, you probably know Lori Evans. Yes. She was involved, not a, no relation to me. And we sat down over a couple of beers and, and talked for two and a half hours. And it was just, it was early in the inception. Mm -hmm. The ONC had just started. You know, Vermont and many other states were wondering, you know, where is this all going to be headed? And I just, I really appreciated the extent to which, you know, the ONC head, like yourself, was willing to come out and sit down and talk with people about uh, some of the issues that, um, that are going on, particularly at the state level, and how to get going. So. I, my question for you is, you know, during those 10 years since the ONC's inception, uh, we've seen the enactment of high tech and Affordable Care Acts. What do you think is ahead for the ONC over the next 10 years? I mean, that's a long period, but I'll ask you to cast that vision. Well, so um, I cold called David Brailer um, from the streets of New Orleans just after Katrina okay. when we, we realized that we had this tremendous opportunity to, to, to not build legacy systems of paper, but to go straight to EHRs, and somehow got him on the phone. I mm. still don't know how that happened, because uh, phones weren't working very well in New Orleans at the time, at mm. any rate. Um, and, and as you described, David was very generous with his time and his team, and they went on to create something called KatrinaHealth.org mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the state of Louisiana. Yep. That was the, um, the beginning of a, a real movement across the state towards the power of health IT to really improve care was the, uh, using pharmacy records in particular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that it didn't help us in New Orleans because <clears throat> we didn't have internet at the time. We were working off the street. But mm. it helped all the folks who had been evacuated and it, it laid this great foundation. Um, David really understood how important states were in advancing health IT policy. So I started um, my remarks to share that um, every state is so different, and within states, it's very different. Um, and that we have at the federal level uh, policy uh, and programmatic instruments that that can be helpful, but they can also be blunt when they hit the ground. Uh, and but in partnership with state governments, with with uh, the private sector at the state level, I think there's uh, an awful lot that can be done. So as we um, look ahead for this next chapter of ONC, uh, my goal is to take the best of what. The pre my predecessors have done the tools in their toolbox, and I'll just run through them. Um, I think um, mm -hmm. David definitely understood the importance of state-level policy and the convening mm -hmm. opportunity of ONC. Rob Kolodner, mm -hmm. the second national mm -hmm. coordinator, had a great understanding of the critical importance of aligning the federal policy levers and programmatic levers. So um, that's, I think of our family as the largest payer, provider, and purchaser mm. of care, or mm -hmm. uh, payer, uh, but a large purchaser and provider mm -hmm. of care through the Office of Employee Health Benefits, the VA, the DOD, the Indian Health Service. Uh, I like to say NASA, because don't forget they have an EHR. They use VISTA, a version of VISTA. Do that. But okay. we have the FTC and the FCC as partners, <clears throat> uh, Department of Education and USDA and many others. In fact, we have a council that we have formed um, that has some 35 departments and agencies from across the federal government working together for a set of shared strategic priorities and an action plan that we can work on together that will send more clear signals to, the, to our partners at the state level and private, in the private sector around things like privacy expectations and, and, uh, and other important issues. You know, uh, David and Farzad were here at a time when they were thinking quite a bit about um, catalyzing the marketplace with, with dollars, developing the infrastructure for health information exchange, understanding the people and process through the Beacon projects, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and thinking about frontline technical assistance in the regional extension center programs and the workforce development programs. The, um, the, the work of, the, of, of Barzad to bring the consumer voice in and to give mm -hmm. them access to data, I think really heightened the pull of, of the information. So as we look to our future 
and reset priorities with that federal council on what the federal health IT strategic plan is, uh, learn from what we have invested in as a country in the High Tech Act, and um, what is the best practices in the private sector. We are looking to weave that together into really a national agenda and something that we know where we need to lead, we the federal government, or where we need to step back, mm -hmm. and um, where we can really help the states um, that are leaders like Vermont to share what they've learned with other places. You know, states like Minnesota have been in this mm -hmm. game for so long, mm -hmm. Maine, other, uh, other parts of our mm -hmm. country, and they, there's a lot to be shared. So this is first of what we hope to be many state convenings mm -hmm. that we had is, is a way that we can leverage um, what can happen at the state level in those defined discrete boundaries uh, of those insurance markets and Medicaid markets and mm -hmm. provider markets that, but we really want to we really want to understand it and, and be helpful. So we have now a new chapter with some regulatory authority and responsibility in the certification programs. Some of our um, grant making programs still in existence, but thinking a lot about how we can help this country continue to advance mm -hmm. uh, and, and in a, in a way that um, I think is newly possible because of changes in from the Affordable Care Act you mentioned, payment yep. reform, development of ACOs. Um, I think really understanding how the patient-centered medical home model can change care for those with significant chronic illness. We have, and now we have data. We have information that we can use to help uh, with the health of the people that we care about in this community. The governor had spoken to, um, you know, the, the shift to value-based payments. Mm -hmm. And um, in Vermont, we're seeing the emergence of uh, accountable care organizations, uh, both of the focus on, um, you know, the... Medicare Shared Savings Program and beginning to gravitate into Medicaid and commercial. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned during my talk, uh, Vital is at the center of that. We're trying to support their data needs for analytics and the like. Mm -hmm. um, where would you see the ONC assisting to help make that happen as we're shifting from volume to value-based payment? Any so in the first, uh, the, the first thing I would share is that the standardization of the standards, um, I might put that also in the category of things that, that well, I already mentioned this, that sort of surprised me mm -hmm. is that we weren't quite as standard as we should be. Right. That will really help because the, if we get those <clears throat> fundamental discrete data points right, those few things that are the fundamental building blocks to the quality measures, ways to measure systolic blood pressure, uh, ways to, to uh, organize the populations we serve, gender, age, then um, the, there's more seamless r reporting. So your work as an analytics mm -hmm. shop mm -hmm. is easier because the data that you receive is alike mm -hmm. and you don't have to do so much cleaning. There's less cost and the information comes back more quickly to the frontline providers or to the systems, the payers, et cetera. So I think uh, our role in, in working with CMS and others is to see that we don't just have macro alignment of measures, the same set of measures across the, the federal payment systems and then reach out and do that with the private payers, but have a measurement system mm -hmm. that is uh, back end and seamless and doesn't require extra chart abstraction on top of what folks mm -hmm. are already doing. So we really mm -hmm. want to move in that direction as quickly as possible to make the big data aggregation easier. We feel an intense amount of responsibility around the privacy and security elements mm -hmm. of that healthcare data. We, as you know, we have an office of the chief privacy mm -hmm. officer within ONC, which was created in the High Tech Act. And this office is growing in size, partially in response to this changing landscape of the kinds of data that are available and that people want to use to understand health beyond health care. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, we work directly with the White House. And there's a recently put out a report on big data and privacy mm -hmm. that, that, that begs some questions about, do we have the right policy and regulatory and legal framework to handle the types of data that are increasingly collected and mashed together, mm -hmm. it's a technical term, on, uh, um, for a variety of uses. And um, I, I think we would agree we don't, right? As you get out outside of HIPAA-covered entities, it gets pretty fuzzy. And I think as you start to think also about a person-centered architecture for data, one in which um, the electronic health record is a part of that bigger ecosystem, just like your banking record is part of your financial picture, that electronic health record from the institution gives that piece, but there's this bigger set of data in the ecosystem that's about health. And there are some, there's, this is an old idea that's taken off again, that, that we ought to be thinking about how we wrap data around a person as mm -hmm. the center and not the institution. We don't really have a technology a framework for that or a privacy and security framework. So when we think about big data, we're thinking about it in those terms. 
I would say um, on a on a more um, uh, on a less of a policy level from a you know that the standpoint of the infrastructure of mm -hmm. ONC, but really more just as um, maybe as Karen. Uh, I have sort of two points I like to often make about big data, which is um, big data is fun to play with, but we don't need to prove that water is wet. We have a lot of important challenges in this country that we need to solve on behalf of the people of this country. And so we should be very thoughtful about our hypotheses going into mm -hmm. the use of the data and respectful of what we're going to collect about people and, and how we're going to use it. Um, and that's one area. The other is um, predicated on research work that I did um, as part of my career using a single measure of self-rated health in general. How would you rate your health? Excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. It's a question I think that they use a lot in Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps here, excellent predictor of subsequent health care utilization, mortality. It's a great stratifier of populations. Um, good risk adjuster, um, used a lot for, by health economists. This single question is um, a way that the human computer, our brain, tells the clinician, tells the health system, tells the whatever, a lot about their past history, mm -hmm. their medical problems, the meds they're on, but also their social, social history, their mental health mm -hmm. situation, their physical health from a functionality stand, function standpoint. It's also got, it has uh, projective capabilities. It tells us about where you think is a person you're going, your vitality. And so it's not just a retrospective look at numbers in a database, but it, it gives you an additional sense of, of where that, that person thinks they're going. And um, it's well studied in international mm -hmm. literature. And the, the point of all that is, is, though I believe a lot in that single question or some versions therein, it's the patient voice piece in the data. So just collecting where I shop is one thing, mm -hmm. but also under, giving us uh, literally a space in the data for the, the person or populations you're studying to be able to speak mm -hmm. is powerful and important and provides very useful information. Um, and, and I don't want us to discount that and just use data that is secondarily collected um, because we'll miss an opportunity. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pause again. Questions from the audience? Shy crowd. Oh, wow. Really shy crowd. OK. <laughs> We were talking about the patient consumer um, in Vermont. We've shifted from, and I like the way you uh, portrayed it this morning, was shifted from the provider-based consent to a patient-based consent. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good comparison that, you know, we, with the Greenmont Care Board's approval now, have gone to a global opt-in for uh, the state. Uh, but the majority of patients in Vermont don't know that. Um, so starting over the next couple months, VITAL is going to begin um, education awareness, and we're going to kind of come out to the publics in Vermont and start beginning to talk about um, the value of exchanging uh, clinical patient information, uh, using use cases like in the vignette this morning to put patients um, in the shoes of the care delivery system and begin to understand uh, uh, the importance of it from a provider standpoint. If they have all the clinical information available, then they can make a more informed decision. Um, but it's, it's often met with um, concern, of course, about privacy, as you alluded to. Uh, do you see the ONC having a role in um, kind of doing that education awareness on a national scale at all? Um, uh, we're, like, as I said, next couple of months begin it here in Vermont, and it'll be you know, purposely focused on um, not just from a patient's context, but also we're hoping to promote things like vital access to or the provider group so that they can get a better understanding of, oh, actually, yes, data generated outside of my little ecosystem is valuable to me. And so some of the products and services and the capabilities vital is introducing are of value to me. But I wonder, do you see the ONC having a role with communicating that on a national basis? I do. We, we've had, first of all, we have so much technical expertise in our office that it, it needs to be put to good use in partnership with the Office of Civil Rights. We work really closely mm -hmm. with them. We have some, some tools online already around security, in particular a security mm -hmm. risk assessment tool, which we've been receiving some feedback on and are working to iterate mm -hmm. uh, to make it even more user-friendly. It, it, um, the, the protection of the data by the providers, the doctors, the um, the hospitals, but I, I pick on the doctors because I'm one, and so it's mm -hmm. easier to do. I think we have to be very thoughtful about 
um, making sure that, that we understand the security expectations, but then also that we understand HIPAA and um, don't um, overuse HIPAA to, mm -hmm. to prevent patients from getting mm -hmm. their own information. You know, patients, um, and we've done work in privacy, working on consent, uh, pl more plain language, mm -hmm. working on a translation, mm -hmm. but th that work is only beginning, yet okay. it is incredibly important to make certain that it's an, 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 an infor a real informed consent mm -hmm. for, for individuals and that we have some, if you, when you start to move into the interoperability sphere, you, you, you know, have challenges about making sure that the, the consent is t um, associated with the data uh, and, and the person as it, as it moves across places like state lines. And then we have other issues to, to resolve um, uh, data segmentation. Mm -hmm. so, so consent that's predicated on or conditioned on who we want to see the data and, and for what purposes. Those are, there are technology and other challenges associated with that. And then there's temporal consent issues. Mm -hmm. So today I may feel differently about who should see my data and, um, and for what purpose, but over mm -hmm. time that may evolve. And so we need to have the flexibility in our, in our privacy consent opportunities for, for the people that we're serving. It, um, again, the, the technology solution often um, is so completely tied in with the privacy and security as we're working through our interoperability roadmap in partnership with states, mm -hmm. with subject matter experts, with our advisory committees. Uh, we were constantly looping back. You know, if you wanted to send data in a certain way across state lines, what are the implications for for um, privacy and security, but, and then they have some vague questions about technology and vice versa. The complexity we can work out, I think what we have to work out is the culture piece. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I mean to say mm -hmm. that education, uh, in real informed consent, uh, making certain that everybody across the chain is, is, uh, understands and appreciates not just the privacy piece, but the security piece also. And, um, and then that we're um, respectful um, of changes over mm -hmm. time. We do on a regular basis, um, we have done two surveys now uh, asking consumers what they believe about privacy and security and um, what their inclinations are mm -hmm. about, about sharing data. We'll have some new data coming out at our Consumer eHealth Summit, that's my plug, which is next Monday um, in, in DC, but it's also mm -hmm. webcast if people want to participate. And that's a day-long opportunity to really have the consumer voice be as loud as possible and for it to help uh, inform people's thinking in the, in the e-health space, uh, but also for folks to present, to present data, including this survey work. Here's what, here's what we know. We know that people, um, really irrespective of, uh, by and large, socioeconomic status mm -hmm. um, and age, are willing to share their data uh, about themselves if it will improve their care and if and make it more publicly available if it helps the health of others. Mm -hmm. So people are very generous about the data mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't lead to discrimination against them. Yeah. And some of that discrimination historically was was about um, uh, about coverage, about right. pre-existing conditions. And with right. the Affordable Care Act changing, we have an opportunity now to, to take away one potential barrier, recognizing that there are other reasons folks may not want uh, some of their data shared. This is, all, this is not easy mm -hmm. stuff, because mm -hmm. as a doctor, uh, you know, and as an internist, mm -hmm. to me, everything about you matters. So I want to know everything about you, every nook and mm -hmm. cranny of your history. But if we build that trust relationship, you and me, mm -hmm. um, as a patient and doctor, then I think the data sharing gets easier also uh, longitudinally. So it, it's not going to happen overnight. It's a major priority. It's something that we are working on now, and we want to work on more. And, and by the way, uh, it's not just about all that, it's about the legal framework. I, I do think this country needs to take a hard look at itself and decide if, if, we're, if we have the right uh, regulatory framework, mm -hmm. legal framework to support what's happening with data in this day and age. And um, the, I mean, we've, lots of folks have come out and said, we may not, so we, right. need to be, we need to get better prepared. John? Question in the audience. Yes. Um, Dr. Savavo, thank you for coming to Vermont. Uh, one of the things Vermont is struggling with is the uh, having built this uh, health information exchange and about to launch it, how do we achieve financial sustainability for the exchange? And the vital board had a retreat about a month ago and basically agreed that the exchange represents a public utility and it's only uh, going to have value if it's uh, used universally. Mm -hmm. uh, and heretofore, we've relied either on federal funds or state funds. But if we're going to continue an exchange as a public utility and seek to have all providers not only put information in but access information out, uh, what uh, continued financial uh, 
support is the federal government going to be provide? That's a great question, Paul. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let me, let me start by saying this one little thing that I didn't say at the outset, which shapes a lot of, of, our, of our thinking at, at ONC and into <clears throat> the future. Uh, our next chapter is a health IT community is about health IT beyond electronic health records. It's about levers beyond meaningful use, mm -hmm. and it's about health beyond healthcare. What do I mean when I say all that, um, and, and how does it relate to his question? Uh, it relates in, this, in, in the following way. So as we're thinking about the broader ecosystem of data, you asked about big data. There's, mm -hmm. there's data that's going to come from places beyond electronic health record, and there already is data that matters mm -hmm. to help understand someone's health. You all have some of the best health in the country. Yes, you have a good health care system, but it's also because you have high rates of graduation mm -hmm. from high school and college mm -hmm. and high employment rates and you have um, a very green state. I don't mm -hmm. mean that in any funny way. I mean, mm -hmm. seriously, a very active state, looking at your numbers. And um, so you are healthy in the broader sense of the term than just a good healthcare system. And that social determinants model, the healthcare systems tend to 20% of health outcomes. So we need to be thinking, as a country, if we really want to move to health, that we need more data than just what's in the EHR. We need to understand a bigger picture and accommodate that. We also need um, to have a bigger frame about how we're going to influence health. And we need to, therefore, think about what are the ways that we can get there. And meaningful use is one of the high-tech mm -hmm. efforts was very successful in advancing EHR adoption in this country. Uh, to, to Bush's comments, uh, um, you know, if you're in a hospital and you have 92% of the time, mm -hmm. essentially, you have an electronic health record, which mm -hmm. is pretty remarkable considering mm -hmm. it's about 15% around right. that time. Right. Uh, on the other hand, um, that's going to be, it's necessary but not sufficient. And, 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 and it's particular to this idea that information about someone's health is more expansive than EHR, so the, the, we have to think of funding outside of the healthcare system as a part of that infrastructure to, to c capture and move data and put it to use. And um, that means also that we're having to think about other ways to fund that. What we learned so far in high tech is that um, grants help spur and get things started. Mm -hmm. They're obviously not a sustainability mm -hmm. model. And as we look across the health information exchanges in the country, there's lots of ways that folks are working on sustainability. But this idea of it being a public good, try to link that again, the public good meaning it's not the healthcare's responsibility entirely, it's the whole community's responsibility to create health for people. Mm -hmm. And so that is, a, that is a set of actors, a set of characters outside of the healthcare system. So the funding shouldn't only be predicated, I believe, on, the, on that slice in the healthcare. We have to start thinking more broadly. And I'm very interested in states like um, Vermont that are thinking about this as a public mm -hmm. good, using more of a utility model so that the where you receive care, the kind of insurance you have, your income, the color of your skin, um, whether you're rural or urban, doesn't predicate whether that data is going to be there to save your life mm -hmm. when you need it. It's actually going to be there, just like the roads are going to be there when you need them. Yep. In Vermont, um, we've enjoyed, as we've talked about, a lot of financial support from state and federal government. Um, and as Paul was just identifying, we're needing to move towards that sustainable model uh, first. We've got to demonstrate the value, though. Mm. Um, you know, clinicians are being bombarded with all kinds of data and uh, requirements mm. to meet uh, meaningful use and um, ICD-10 and all the rest of that that's really consuming them. So my um, focus is very much right now on uh, getting vital to a point where it actualizes its name and it can actually demonstrate to clinicians there is value. One of the gaps I've seen um, in health information exchange over the years is we haven't done a very good job of quantifying that. It's difficult to do that. Um, can you mm -hmm. really, when a clinician has a radiology report, uh, be able to say they didn't order another chest x-ray because that, they have that report and as a result, you know, X amount of money was saved. Mm -hmm. So, and I know there've been, you know, we've waded into this a little bit in some studies around the U.S., but, um, it's, it's a tough value proposition. It's something that has to be uh, identified, quantified, and then we can kind of extrapolate the potential savings. Do you, do you see the ONC moving in that kind of direction at all to help kind of quantify that? Is that something that? Boy, that's a great question. We don't uh, currently have a project underway in that sphere, but I, I, um, 
but the through our evaluation process, we're mm -hmm. looking at how some states mm -hmm. are quantifying it, so mm -hmm. we haven't started something de novo. Uh, on the other hand, um, we have a, a few uh, efforts that are ongoing to think about the go forward and how we can uh, inform what, what various gaps are, not just in funding, for example, for HIE, but in public health workforce. Mm -hmm. So it's in, it's in the sort of work plan and the necessity for the interoperability, very specifically around the sustainability plan um, the, the five building blocks that we laid out mm -hmm. in our interoperability plan. One yep. of them is about the, the, the business financial model. Right. And we're going to be working um, uh, first through uh, some subject matter experts through a contract to gather the current best thinking and, frankly, look at other industry. Mm -hmm. We've been using mm -hmm. that a lot in the last few months that mm -hmm. ONC is what is, was done in the financial sector and in the aviation sector, railroads, to try to you yep. know, solve some of these challenges. And I, I think that's going to be a really, a, a really important piece. But... And, and just the, from the culture change standpoint, I want to mention this. Uh, I mentioned I'm doing a listening session here this afternoon. Yep. And one of my um, secret sneaky agenda reasons for doing those is, is, yes, I hear a lot, and it's really helpful. But it's also a way uh, that I'm hoping to bring people together around a table to talk about health IT who wouldn't t typically be in the same room. Mm -hmm. So um, as we continue to expand this, we're going to be including urban planners and school leadership and others to really start thinking more more about health IT as being a part of the, the bucket of things that are necessary for a healthy community. Yep. And that, I think, begins to change the sustainability exactly. conversation. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it changes also, by the way, thinking about things like governance for entities like VITAL right. and, and or where that fits in the system. So back to all of the begged questions, iteratively over time, we have to make, um, we have to make allowance that as data changes, as and, and as the uses of that data changes and as the inputs to it change, we're going to have to uh, have the flexibility in our governance structure and our regulatory structure that it can accommodate that. And I don't think we quite have that yet in right. the country with some exceptions. Right. Well, we'd love to participate Good. if we have an opportunity. So um, Dr. DeSalvo will be um, the question right at, the, yep, at the Community Health Center this afternoon in yes. Burlington. What time is that? I don't know. 2.30-ish, 12.30-ish. Six o'clock? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She's there till her flight leaves this evening. So, yes. This is, this is, I used to have my schedule memorized because I used to make my schedule. And since I've been, maybe this is my biggest, since I've been in this job, people make my schedule for me. And I like, barely know where I'm going to be from one minute to the next. It's a really interesting experience. <laughs> Question yeah. from the audience. Yes, Dr. Selva, thank you for being here. I'm Joel Benware, I'm Vice President of IT and Compliance at uh, St. Albans uh, Northwestern Medical Center. Um, many of our hospitals here in Vermont uh, obviously are achieving meaningful use, and we're noticing the incentives are aligned for each hospital to achieve meaningful use on their own. When we work collaboratively as a state, we're trying to put this, the patient at the center of our initiatives, and we're noticing the incentives are aligned for each hospital or each physician office to attain meaningful use on their own. We're trying to work collaboratively. We're trying to put the patient at the center. We're thinking of things like statewide patient portals. We can't seem to get it done because every hospital is kind of out for themselves achieving that. Can you speak to how we can work collaboratively, how we can incentivize physicians and hospitals to work collaboratively to put the patient at the center of our care? Well, I think you all have made a lot of the right choices about how to see that data can go into motion. And, when, and when I, what I mean by saying that is um, choices about advancing uh, the, the payment models that you have in, in your communities and also making the technology as easy and seamless as possible so that it, it when you as a clinician go into the system to find information from another entity, it's going to be there. When you go into the vital HIE, it's not going to be a third of the data. It's going to be almost all of the data. So that will make us come back as clinicians if we go. We don't find anything. We won't use the portal again. Mm. Sorry. And um, so, so, you know, the timing of, of interoperability, I'm going to belabor this point a little bit. Every place I have been in the country is a slightly different part of the... Um, the um, cycle of healthcare, and um, there are there are marketplaces where their value-based payment is a, a pretty significant portion of their um, of their their revenue in the healthcare system, and so there are a lot of ACOs in the marketplace, um, and there's a lot of incentive to see data from other 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 institutions, and so those. Um, drivers have created an opening of the, the data portal so that it is easier to share. 
Um, the, you know, the idea behind Meaningful Use Stage 2 was that we would push that issue and require there to be trading partners in the ecosystem um, so that you would have, that would be one of the incentives. But I think most of us are realizing that the, the bigger incentive is, is the payment structure in, in the insurance marketplace. That's really, yes, you want to have a closed ACO system. You, want, you don't want people to go outside, but people do go outside. That's how we are um, as, as humans. And we go across state lines or we're in other places. So I think you need to have an opportunity to have visibility of, of the care patterns of patients across uh, institutions. And frankly, they want it too. They don't want to be stuck twice or get two x-rays if they don't have to. And, and so we have to um, have, a, have a better shot. So I would say uh, it's hard for me to predict the future here in Vermont, but I get the sense that you all are right on the cusp based upon what you're doing, what the governor's doing and others with your SIM model and with thinking about um, advancing your payments to being more uh, value-based. It's frankly what we're trying to do at the federal level is to really keep driving that set of incentives so that it's not about the data, it's about the care. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. like you shouldn't compete on data, and, and nor should developers or vendors. We should really be competing on the quality of care that we're delivering and the outcomes uh, to the people that we serve. Um, as we look forward to Meaningful Yay Stage 3, these are the kinds of lessons that we want to learn and, and think about. And, and uh, it's, it's no secret that, that um, as we're, I mean, you know, for um, who's been in the federal government before in the room? Raise your hand high. Be oh, proud. Really? <laughs> Don't be shy. Except for your hill rats. The, um, <laughs> geez, you fall. The, you know, <laughs> It's uh, the arc of our rulemaking and our, is so long. So if you don't understand that, it's like this is sort of this really great. Maybe that's I have a whole list of surprises. Maybe I'll write an article on it. But you know, coming from municipal government, um, it's a pretty short timeline, and this is a very long arc. We started thinking about meaningful use three. Um, I don't know, two and a half years ago, before mm -hmm. I was even here. And um, are obviously been hearing a lot from our FACAs, looking at a lot of data that's coming in about one and about two, and not just about two attestations, but stage two um, survey work that we get from the hospitals, for example. What are you capable of doing and what are you likely to do, given the systems that you have in place? So we're, we're, trying, we're taking all that in, and I take this in and listen and think about what's happening on the front lines and um, consider how we can get to a place, as you're describing, where... Um, the systems, the IT systems are playing a platform that's making it more seamless to share data, and, that, and that's not the inhibitor of the interfaces um, uh, and, and, the, and those barriers, but that instead the standards are aligned enough and the incentives are aligned enough and the cultures are aligned enough that the information can move. I don't think we're going to get there overnight entirely across the country, but there are, I know that we can get there because I know there are places in this country where that happened. We had a panel um, discussion yesterday mm -hmm. evening and they had a group of other health information exchanges here and about 100 people attended, which was great. Uh, one of the topics that was discussed was 42 CFR Part 2. Mm -hmm. So uh, the extent to which substance, alcohol and substance abuse data is uh, becoming a barrier for healthcare providers to exchange um, patient and clinical data. Uh, I know it's a frustration here in Vermont, we're trying to figure out approaches that can be taken. I'm not sure we heard any real clear, distinct answer from the HIEs that were represented there mm -hmm. yeah, yesterday evening. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Uh, we talked a little bit this morning. My concern is that, you know, yes, we can kind of filter those patients out, if you will, but to leave them out mm -hmm. is a travesty. And unfortunately, because we haven't solved the part two issue, um, that's that's kind of becoming the case because it precludes the exchange of data for non part two patients. So I wonder what your thoughts are on this. SAMHSA is obviously, you know, um, looking for changes to be made and has a comment period currently. But uh, what what are your thoughts as head of the ONC? Well, uh, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing in some of your data about the adoption because you all are uh, ahead of many parts of this country, frankly, in the inclusiveness of mm -hmm. non-MU providers. This is in the list of things that keep me up at night, are um, not just that the providers aren't MU, but the people they're taking care of, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the behavioral health, so mental health and substance abuse sphere, long-term post-acute care providers are some of the most vulnerable people right. we have in our community. Exactly. And we're uh, losing visibility about what, what's <clears throat> happening to their, to their health needs. We have potential 
I, I don't even need to belabor the point. I mean, it's just um, something we've really got to solve as a country. And so you all are making some progress in it. I've seen some other states doing that mm -hmm. through their SIM grants. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe you can share with me later sort of the secret sauce that you all are trying to employ. It starts, when you do that though, it starts to bring in other challenges. So you mentioned the 42 CFR issues of substance abuse providers. And so um, we've been really actively engaged with SAMHSA on that in a, in a host of ways. They do have a meeting tomorrow, I think, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if it's webcast or not, but um, we, we can certainly find out to share where they'll be speaking of some of these things, mm -hmm. including some of the work we've been doing uh, on like content, consent to share. Right. And understanding how you can do um, data segmentation at the, um, it's not so much at the atomic level, it's at the document level, but also thinking about the consent and some clarity around that. We've done some uh, pilot work to, to catalyze ideas with, with some of the developers. Mm -hmm. Cerner was actively engaged to try to understand the technology opportunities and challenges there. I'd say that that's all um, pretty new um, and, mm -hmm. and n uh, I'd say stiff, <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. would be the word. So mm -hmm. I don't think we yet have a great solution. There's some big systems that are using role-based mm -hmm. options. Um, it's the, that's a financial term, but right. the way that you would get into a system um, to, to try to protect people's data, and then you could do that inverse uh, consent thing. So I'm not gonna share, but then that often is a signal that that person exactly. is in substance abuse. So mm -hmm. I guess if I were to, we're, so we're very engaged with SAMHSA and with our FACAs, and by the way, in case you all aren't tracking on it, have been working at the, the request of the behavioral health community to set out some broad guidelines around what um, um, certification might look like for mm -hmm. behavioral health, electronic okay. health records, and yeah. long-term post-acute care, mm -hmm. so that in the event that we move in that direction, we're ready to, to support that so that it, it will plug and play. Um, and um, that, but yeah, we're not gonna get to a place where we have, I think, really better health and, and at a lower right. cost unless we can be inclusive of those populations. And I met this gentleman, um, his name I'm gonna forget, Bob maybe, from Department of Justice this morning. And um, while we're thinking about health settings, et cetera, um, and um, the sort of high-risk populations, that's another really important yeah. part of this where there's particular challenges and issues around consent and data sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, needs to be solved. Really um, high-risk, high-vulnerable population exactly. yeah. that um, gets lost in the system all mm -hmm. too easily. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? I know we're about out of time, and I wanted to give you the opportunity. Any final comments, any words of advice um, for Vermont that you can share with us? Well, um, first of all, you have the best name for an HIE ever, Vital. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, I, I genuinely mean thank you for being leaders. Mm -hmm. I think what's exciting about a place like Vermont is you have a community of people who are working together to solve problems and you're doing that on the ground. Um, we want to be your partner in that. We want to facilitate where it matters. We want to um, push our federal partners where they can be helpful. That's one of our responsibilities in the mm -hmm. High Tech Act mm -hmm. is to be the convener for the federal folks. We're doing that through our strategic planning and priority setting process, which will be made public for comment for folks um, towards the end of this calendar year. We want your feedback on that set of priorities mm -hmm. that the federal government will undertake to know if we're spending your money in the way that you want us to. Mm -hmm and spending our time in that way. And then uh, going forward, we wanna really have a national consensus around where we should be working together and who should do what, interoperability being mm -hmm. the major place that mm -hmm. we wanna focus again, because if we get some of those challenges right, it solves some of your issues on the ground, whether it's in adoption or interoperability or use. Uh, and, and I'll just say what I said in the middle there, and I, I wanna just challenge you all to keep thinking this way, which is to remember that the health IT infrastructure and opportunity is more than about electronic health records. Mm -hmm. So that's where we've made a huge investment and we mm -hmm. should get that data right. But um, consumers in particular and others really know that there's other sources of data and it gives a better picture of their health. And we owe it to them to, to have a framework that allows for that to, to be considered as we're advancing health and that uh, where we're really um, interested at ONC is understanding at the federal, state, and local level, and with the private sector, what are the drivers to advance health IT in communities to improve health, mm -hmm. and um, remembering that we learned a lot from the catalyzing work of the High Tech Act, but we also learned that sometimes uh, big levers that um, drive change can be more sustainable 
uh, if they're embedded in the everyday work that everyone does. And so we're really thinking through what are those ways that we can advance the marketplace um, without um, it being stop and start, right? We want to make mm -hmm. sure it's, it's really sustainable and governed by you folks locally. Great. Well, thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming to Vermont. Um, our weather is like this all the time, and you should come back. So um, we'd love to have you back at some point in time. Um, I'm inspired but by your context and where you're taking the ONC. Um, uh, we appreciate your leadership, and uh, thank you again for coming to join us. And on behalf of the audience, uh, uh, thanks for, I know you have a busy schedule, but flying up here and uh, spending the day with us. So Thank, thank, thank you coming. all so much for the time. at this point um, until 11.15. At that time, uh, the breakout first breakout sessions will start. Thank you.